Welcome to our worship today from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar, in this season of Eastertide. The hymn at the end of the service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, Give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading today is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. On that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised Jesus, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. To travel, hopefully, is better than to arrive, said Robert Louis Stevenson. Of course, he'd never had to tackle the M25 in rush hour or squash onto a crowded commuter train, but he had a point. Sometimes the journey does matter far more than the destination. We found that, I think, in those early Covid lockdowns, 
when many people discovered the footpaths around their homes and walked them obsessively, just glad to get out at all. We all ended up back where we started, of course, but those journeys fed our bodies, our minds, our spirits. There's something about being on the move, especially at walking pace, that unlocks our minds, frees us to think and to be. Journeys often confront us with obstacles too, external and internal. Times when we're not sure where to go, or when we wonder why we set off at all. And those challenges can make us grow. And journeys taken in company offer us the possibility of getting to know one another in different ways. It can be easier to talk to someone else when we're on the move, alongside each other rather than face to face. That certainly seems to have been the case with the journey we heard about in our Gospel reading today. Two disciples are heading out of Jerusalem towards what's evidently their home in the village of Emmaus, about seven miles away. We don't know anything about them apart from the name of one of them, Cleopas, but whoever they are, they're fed up. When a stranger joins them, he asks what the matter is. Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there, they answer. What things, he replies, somewhat disingenuously, because actually, of course, it was him they were happening to. But he knows that they need to tell the story in their own words. And that's what they do as he walks along by their side, just listening. They tell him about the person they'd hoped would be the one who would redeem Israel, a certain Jesus of Nazareth, who they'd just seen crucified. No wonder they're traumatised, we might think, but it turns out to be more complicated than that. Because they go on to say that some of the women in their group have said Jesus is alive again, and their story of an empty tomb has been confirmed. It isn't Jesus' death that's been the last straw for this pair of disciples, but the news that he might not be dead after all. It's as if they could cope with the despair and grief, but they can't cope with hope, with the possibility that the story isn't over, but is actually just beginning. Maybe you've been in that position yourself, knocked back by life one time too many past the point at which you feel you have the energy to try again. A new opportunity presents itself, but it feels like too much of a risk. People often get rather distracted in this story by the question of why the disciples don't recognise Jesus. Serious amounts of time have been wasted over the centuries trying to explain it away. The precise angle of the sun in their eyes, the fact that they're walking side by side and so on. But I don't think Luke means us to get hung up on the mechanics of all this. The fact is they need this long walk with Jesus. They need this time. They need to say what they say and to listen as he opens up different possibilities for them. They need the rhythm of putting one foot in front of the other alongside this stranger. Whether they know it or not, they need to not recognise him, at least for a while. Still, seven miles is a long way, and seven miles in the wrong direction, away from where they need to be, is an even longer way. But sometimes this is how it has to be. The journey is more important than the destination. The metaphor of life as a journey is common in the Bible, of course. Psalm 23 is an obvious example. God as a shepherd who guides the flock through green pastures and still waters, along paths of righteousness, through dark valleys and all the way home to the place where the table is spread, the house of the Lord, to dwell there forever. But we might also think of Abraham told to go from his own native land to the new land God is giving him, or of Moses and the Israelites trekking round and round the wilderness on their way from Egypt to the promised land. And Jesus himself was almost constantly on the move too, travelling around Galilee and far beyond, going from village to village, town to town, 
sometimes across the Sea of Galilee in a boat, but often just walking, 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 meeting people along the way. Often the most important conversations he has arise from what look like interruptions or diversions, chance meetings, a Samaritan woman at a well, or lepers who call out to him as he goes along. If he had a grand plan when he set out on his journeys, it isn't obvious. He just seems to set off and see what happens. And if it takes longer to get to where he's going because of those who needed him, then that's fine. That's what he's doing here, making a seven-mile journey in the wrong direction before these despairing disciples are ready to recognise him, because that's how long it needs to take. When he breaks bread and the light dawns, their aching feet and their aching hearts are suddenly healed, and without a second thought they rush to retrace their steps, all seven miles of them, back to Jerusalem, to be part of what comes next. But it couldn't have happened without that first seven-mile journey. This is a story which is very good news for all of us, because our journeys through life and through faith are rarely straightforward in my experience. Looking back, we might lament what looked like wrong turnings, blind alleys, long detours in our lives. Looking ahead, we often have no idea where we're going, or we feel paralysed by the prospect of making the wrong choice, taking the wrong route. Like the Israelites in the wilderness with Moses, it can take us 40 years to make a journey that should logically have only taken a matter of weeks. We can hear the message of God's love over and over again before something suddenly makes it real to us, before we realise that, yes, he means us too, he loves us too. We can recognise and applaud his call to others over and over again, before we realise that he's calling us to, that we have something to give, something to do that's ours and ours alone. And he never says, what took you so long? It doesn't make any difference to him whether we're six or 96. He'll keep walking alongside us, down the wrong paths as well as the right ones, until we're ready to recognise his presence and to respond to it. The message of this story is that God doesn't just sit enthroned on a far distant heaven. He travels with us wherever we go, whether we know it or not, just waiting to begin that life-changing conversation we need at the moment when we're ready for it. Today's Gospel invites us to stop worrying about where we've been or where we're going and simply to walk with God telling him what it's like for us where we are right now and listen to him until we arrive at the place where, like those two disciples, we are finally convinced of his love. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we share the peace, we hold in our minds those from whom we are separated, members of our congregation, our families, our friends. And we remember that in God's hands we are all held together. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Almighty God, who raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high, may we know your resurrection power in our daily lives and look with hope to that day when we shall see you face to face and share in your glory 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you.